got your Bibles, we'll start in Luke chapter 8 tonight. Luke chapter 8. Uh, Pastor Brian had asked me to do this service, and I had something totally different planned. And uh, w- when I started going, uh, I just I got up really early this morning. I started praying in the Holy Spirit. I went to the gym. And as I was at the gym, I was, I was listening to... Come on, that's right. Come on, yeah, get up. Go to, I, I said I went to the gym. I just watched people work out. I judge everybody. I'm just kidding. Y'all, I can tell you, y'all ever been on one of those stair, those stepper machine, stair machines? That is, uh, pulling weeds in one of those things will be in hell. I am telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. There'll be one section of hell where you just pull weeds, pull it, and one will grow right back in that spot. And the other will be that stair machine, okay? Now, I, I like that stair machine. I do. I like it. It's, it's tough, but I, I'm not going to let it beat me. Amen. I got mountains to take, amen? All right, I'm glad y'all with me on that. Luke chapter 8, but as I was at the gym this morning, um, I, I, I usually listen to music, y'all. And I, can, I, can I tell y'all something, y'all not, y'all not be mad at me? I, I can't always listen to worship when I'm working out. It's hard to work out to shout to the Lord. Just something don't make, I mean, and, and y'all ever notice that the songs that say shout, nobody's really shouting in the song? Shout to the Lord is like really somber, like, oh, oh, it's it's putting me to sleep. No. And so this morning, I I couldn't find a podcast. I couldn't find no music. And I was like, Lord, I got these big old headphones on. I got to listen to something. And uh, he said, well, why don't you listen to my word? And so I I got my little Bible app out, and it just read to me the whole time working out. That makes me better than all of you. (laughs) I just wanted to say that because somebody thinking, you think you're better than me. I know somebody was thinking that. No, sometimes it's not the word I'm listening to, okay? Luke chapter 8. But as I was listening this morning, just so many things, just refreshing, just came over me. And some of the things we'll talk about tonight came through that experience. Luke chapter 8, verse 22. One day when Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a, to the boat, into a boat, and started out. As they, sailed across, uh, as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water, and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him, shouting, Master, Master, uh, we're, doing, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging storm uh, and the waves, and suddenly the storm stopped, and all was calm. Then he asked them, Where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed at the same time. Who is this man? They ask each other, when he gives a command, even the winds and the waves obey him. Amen. Let's go on and continue reading because this story goes a lot longer. Um, well, let's just talk about this for a minute. Jesus uh, was in a, uh, he, was, he was preaching, and one thing I love about this, he felt so confident in his teaching to his disciples. He felt comfortable enough to sleep on the boat and leaving them in charge. And, you know, when the storm came up, and, and, and y'all, y'all have to listen to me here. This story is recorded in three different Gospels, and you get three different uh, variations of the story. But you do get some of the same things. He did question their faith. He did rebuke the storm. He did tell it to cease, be quiet. Um, I've told y'all before what the Holy Spirit told me that when he said, he, peace, uh, um, he, he, when he rebuked the storm, it was peace. He said, peace, be still. Peace is power over chaos. And so when he, when he spoke that peace, the, no, storms cannot exist and cannot stand in the middle of the peace of God. Amen? The, storms, storms come, don't they? Yeah, can, we can all agree storms come. But you know what? As quick as they come, we have the authority to make them go. This is not the point of the story tonight. I just always like to throw that in there. Uh, when he, he, but I love the fact that when... Everything was said and done. Jesus, now I hate it when somebody does this to new believers. But as followers of Christ, I love this when, when we can have a storm come up and we question our faith. We question how strong our faith is. Did we, what did we do in the middle of the storm? The expectation was, and they had been taught to use their authority in the storm. Jesus had prepared them for anything that come up that would come up in the storm. He had already given them a direct word. What was the word he gave them in the very first? 
Let's go to the other side. Jesus' expectation when he got into the boat, listen, I looked this up today. The trip across this lake was four miles. Now, you don't think, well, four miles doesn't seem a lot, but you're thinking in a motorboat, okay? These guys had to row and get across the lake, okay? And when they got to the two-mile mark of this, uh, right in the middle of it, this is when the storm comes up. And it, doesn't it just always seem that way? That, that when, when you're right in the middle of something, the storm comes up? But, you know, Jesus had such expectation. He, he felt like he had taught them to use their faith. He was not worried about anything that came up. He had already empowered them to, to speak to storms, to do anything, handle anything. But the reason he questioned their faith is for the, for the rest of the story. It wasn't just to say, hey, you know what? It wasn't just a question, why didn't they use their authority? Because here's, one, here's the two things that we do, and they're both right here in the story. The two things we do when storms come up. Number one, we either go and we rebuke the storm ourselves. We've learned to do it. We've learned to speak to the storms. We've learned to use our faith and, 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 and our, our, our authority against the storms. Or we cry out and wonder where God's at in the situation. It's, it's, it's a pass or fail situation. And a lot of times what we do is, is we, we, there, I don't think there's a middle place. I think there's a deciding place. I think there's a time where you're going, okay, what do I do in a storm? What does the manual say? What does the manual say in the middle of a storm? Batten down the hatches. We don't have hatches. Okay. Uh, what's, what's step two? Uh, uh, send out a flare. No, uh, we don't have flares. This is before flares. You know, no, it was, e it was one or two things. It was either cry and say, God, where are you right now? God, what are you doing right now? God, don't you see we're in the middle of a distressing situation? Do you not even care that if this, if this goes any further, we could die? We could go bankrupt. We would have to file chapter 8 or whatever it is, bankruptcy. We would have to, we, we, we're in the middle of a storm and divorce is imminent. If you do not step in, where are you? And God the whole time says, I've given you authority for that too. I've given you the ability to see this. Now, I, I'm going to tell you something. I love being on the ocean. I love being on the lake. I, I, I love being on the water. But if your boat is taken on water, you think, man, I wish I was on land right now. <laughs> there's no place like home. There's no place like you click in your heels. There's no place like home. You want to be on dry ground, but you were just enjoying that boat ride. And the reason Jesus questioned, he, he didn't question passengers, he questioned his disciples. Church, there are times when situations come up and you know that you may not have acted in your full authority. You may not have exercised your faith. You may not have spoke to the storm. You may not have stood and looked it directly in the eye, and, but you might have wavered and you might have blamed God that you were taken on water, that a storm came up in the first place. You, you, you will go there, but there's that place in between you say, okay, I, stop, stop, stop. God didn't cause this. His commandment was go to the other side. There's something that's happened in the middle, but I have to decide. He gave a word. There's the other side. We're going there. Storm, stop. In the name of Jesus, stop. Cease, quit. Peace right now in the name of Jesus. And I say this because Jesus questioned his disciples not because of just the storm but was going to, what was going to happen after the storm let's keep reading the story luke chapter 8 verse 26 the storm stopped oh praise jesus you know you the disciples were like, i don't know why you was worried i knew we got this yeah I, i'm sure a lot of them were like man why why were you you were you were shouting you were you were whining like a little girl you know no offense to little girls sorry verse 26 i'll be quiet before I get in trouble. Verse 26, then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. Like I said, about four miles away. And when he stepped out of the, onto the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. Say long time. Long time. And he wore no clothes. Hello. Nor did he live in a house but in the tombs. 
When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had often seized him, and he kept, and kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by demons into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because, we, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. Now a herd of swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it to the city and in the country. And then they went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at his feet, at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and in his what? Oh, y'all know the story. Say that again, right mind. Because the first thing that happens in a situation is it does not confuse your heart, it confuses your mind. And to what I want to talk to you tonight is about your mind. Amen? I, I did talk about all the faith stuff because that was important to the story. But I want you, let's go back up here to verse 26. And I want you to picture, I love, I, see, the, the, the Hebrew is about numbers and, and, and definitions and, and, and so many things, you know, intricate about the Hebrew language. But the Greek language is about pictures. So when you read something that was from the Greek, it, it, it was, it, the Greek was, uh, was made so that when you read it, um, it paints a picture for you, okay? So uh, go with me with your imagination as we read this and look at what happened. The, so they had just come, the two, the, I, I bet they're looking back and they're going, where did that storm, man, that thing came out from nowhere, and all of a sudden they hit the shore of, uh, of, of the Gadarenes that, when they had sailed there. Now look at this. And when he stepped onto the land, when Jesus stepped onto the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. I mean, he's just getting out of the boat. And this demoniac is, has approached him. Now, I don't want you to use as much imagination on this, but he had no clothes. <laughs> I mean, there's no telling how he really looked when i looked up how many soldiers were in a legion it was depending on the story you read it was five to six thousand five to six thousand can you imagine I, i've seen people demonically possessed i've seen them demonically um uh, inspired I, i've seen demonic activity in people's lives um, I have been part of ministries where we, we have had to use all of our faith and to, to cast out demons. But this man, this one man, had opened himself up to have at least, in the minimum, 5,000 different demonic spirits living inside of him. I mean, it's not one big spirit. It is 5,000 demonic spirits living inside of one human person. You've got to think what is attached to those spirits. You, can you, we can't name, we can't name. <laughs> Were you in Mayberry today? <laughs> How's your mama and them? Good Lord. I've been trying to break that over my life. We can't name 5,000 diseases that this man carried. We cannot name 5,000 fears that this man uh, had inside of him. 
We can't name 5,000 different forms of perversion and lies and sin that lived inside of this man. 5,000 of anything is a lot. Matter of fact, give me $5,000, I'll show you. <laughs> but I'm, <psst. laughs> this, I mean, this was not a casual thing. And the reason Jesus questioned them in the boat is because what you're about to see is worse than this storm. And if you ain't got faith for this little old wind blowing out here on the water, you ain't going to have the faith for five, a man with 5,000 demonic influences in his life. See, the reason, to see, we, we read that story and we think the storm is a big test. No, the big test is what's next. And if we don't pass the storm test, we won't pass the next test. We have got to be at a place in our life where we, where faith is our reaction, not fear. All the disciples on the boat reacted the same way. There's not one disciple given credit for it. We didn't say, and Peter said, don't wake the master. We'll speak to the storm. That's not in the word. Not one of the disciples are credited with the fact that when the storm came up, they all reacted the same way to the storm. Do you think they learned something during that storm? What do, what do you think they learned? That the name of Jesus is more powerful than the storm. The, 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 here's what, the, I think when they woke him up, okay, watch this, he's going to wave his magic fingers. <sighs> No, he just spoke to the storm. He spoke using his authority. He spoke out of his faith to the storm. And when the, they're like, oh, well, this is a big storm. This is like a, you know, three, level three hurricane right here. No, no, it did not matter what it was. It had, it was no match for faith in Jesus' name. And so I want, you to, I, want, I want you to understand that the next time you have a, a, a situation, a storm come up, that we're not going to run to blame God for the storm. We're going to do what he's instructed us to do and speak to the storm. This is our role. See, Jesus didn't wake up out of the boat to protect himself. He woke up to protect everybody on the boat. But the same faith that he used to rebuke the storm, he, he felt comfortable enough to sleep knowing that they had the same amount of faith. It's one thing to have the faith. It's another thing because faith comes by what? And people do a whole lot of hearing but a lot less speaking. And we have got to learn that this storm that has come up, even though it came out of nowhere, we didn't see this storm coming. It doesn't matter. We all know where the storms come from. Those kind of storms come from the pit of hell. Guess where that storm's got to go back to? Exactly. But it's not going to go back. It's not going to go back where it came from by you going, stop. You stop it right now. There, look, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't yell. I don't yell a lot, okay? But there are times when I'm alone and something's going on in my life that, that you can hear me across the house. I, I don't have one of those big shouting preacher voices like a lot of people have. I've tried it sometime and needed a gallon of water to fix my throat. I was like, man, if I could just, if I could just get a shout out. No, I don't have that shout, so. I don't, I don't have it. But you know what? I do have. You don't have to have a shout to have authority. You use faith when you have authority. You ever been driving down the road in your car? <laughs> this has nothing to do with traffic cones. And you pass somebody driving a nice sports car. You're in your uh, Avalon. And you pass somebody driving a vet, 
a Corvette, not, not a Chevette, Corvette. <laughs> and you have the pedal to the floor, you bobbing and weaving out of traffic. You get up on this Corvette and you wonder, why is he driving so, anybody ever done this? If I was in that car, whew. No, no, he knows how much power he has. He just knows how to control it. He knows it's available. And when he needs it, he will use it. He don't need to show off to your Avalon. He's not threatened. <laughs> He's not threatened by your Prius, okay? He understands. <laughs> he understands. <laughs> Anybody got a Prius in here? I, I, okay. I love you. Forgive me for that, okay? I said Avalon because I don't even know if they make them anymore, okay? Anybody got an Avalon in here? Oh, right here. You got a, who's got a, oh, you got an Avalon? Uh, forgive me, forgive me. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> and you know, you know why? Somebody doesn't have to shout, have to have a loud voice. You can just look at that storm and you can speak straight to it just like you would any time. That storm knows what authority sounds like. You can speak to your financial storm, your relationship storm, your job storm. Amen. But Jesus questioned them about their faith because what was coming next would require. It, it's, it, look, they probably hadn't been, seen a storm like that before, but they hadn't seen one man with 5,000 demons before either. Imagine you being one person facing an army of 5,000. Your odds are not well. And this one man, it has been reported. They, they, this is actually written in here. So somehow they had the report that when he first started manifesting, they would, people in the town would wrap him up in chains and cuffs and fetters. They would wrap him in iron, not just chains, but iron, wrap him and cuff him up in those things to hold him still. He's got 5,000 demons. He was able to bust out of that. He and Houdini, he's possessed. This is a serious situation. And the moment Jesus got, the Bible, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm reading that right. The Bible says when he got out of the boat, the man met him. Because I'm sure that other people have used that same passage to get to the Gadarenes. But that same man has run off a lot of boats. This boat was different. It was carrying the anointing. This boat was different. It was carrying the one who was going to bring deliverance to the captive. And when he got out of the boat, he, the, I'm sure the, the man, the demons thought, well, there's 5,000 of us. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do something to these guys. There's only 12 of them. But, uh, but Jesus, when he stepped out of the boat, everything changed. The Bible says that they hit the ground screaming, do not torment me. 5,000 demons. When he questioned them and said, what's your name? And they said, Legion, for we are many. Shout, speaking up to Jesus from their knees. From his knees saying, Whoa, don't torment me. Are you here to send me to the abyss? Don't send us to the abyss. Send us into those pigs. I want you to understand. The pigs at the time, the re they were in this, this part. The Jews did not go to this place. Jesus was taking a big chance going over to the Gadarenes because they did not honor the, a lot of the Jewish, uh, uh, they didn't honor the Jewish law. Pigs were unclean. Pigs were not even something they would keep as part of any livestock. So being in a country where all this happened, matter of fact, Jesus actually said, you know what, I'm not going to try to name all 5,000 of you. I'm just going to call you unclean. It's the same term they use for those pigs. And so he says, yes, go to the pigs. Now, I want you, to, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about the mind. We're trying to get there, trying to get there. We're talking about the mind. What happened to the pigs when the demonic influences went into the pigs? They lost their mind. They lost their mind. The, uh, it was so, so much torment in those pigs that all they could think, the only relief I can get is to run down this hill, go into the water, and die. 
That is the only way. And we have people in this world, people in this society, people in the town we live in, people in our neighborhoods. They're so demonically, there's so much demonic influence in their life. I'm not talking about just possession, just influence. That their minds are being tormented and, and at some point they're thinking, the only way to, for me to ever feel any relief is to be dead. Because the effect that Jesus had on this man when he rebuked that demon and, and all the demons and they all left. The Bible says when the, the herdsmen saw their <laughs> it's time to clock out, pigs are dead. <laughs> they ran into the town and told everything that had happened. I think it's a waste of bacon, but that's another story. That was bad, wasn't it? <laughs> Should have just kept going. Okay. Read the room, Maxwell. Come on. <laughs> and uh, they came back after it was published. These guys went and said, here's what happened. Dude got out of the boat. Our demon boy went over there to scare him away. And all of a sudden... Uh, the guy in the, in the boat laid hands on him or spoke to him or something. Crazy. You, you need to come see this. So they all came to see this. And they're looking around and, and the, the effect that Jesus, the anointing, had on this man was that 5,000 in one moment under the anointing of God through faith, the, those 5,000 demons could not keep a home in a human person. They came to find, and they found him. I, I, I love this. Let, let me share this with you. I looked up today in, the, in one of the uh, concordances I have. I was like, okay, I'm just going to see what the Bible says about a demon. I mean, I, I know what a demon is. I know how to describe it. But it says it's a supernatural spirit with a bad nature. <laughs> that describes my first youth group. That was... <laughs> But I, I love this because the Bible calls it an unclean spirit. I'm going to finish that, what, my last thought in just a moment. I took all these notes, so I'm going to read them, okay? In verse 29, he, said, he uses the word unclean spirit. The word unclean mean, means anti-law, anti-holiness, and anti-righteousness. What it means, it, it comes with this, these two little letters at the front of it, which, which says this. Whatever this word means for good, these two little letters mean it's the exact opposite. So anything you think good, he had 5,000 of the opposite inside of him. Anti-righteous, anti-holy, anti-law. He, he had this, uh, you know, I, lo I love this part about Jesus because I would have done this a after everybody left. I was like, okay, tell me your story, bro. What were you into that you got 5,000 demons? Tell me about your mama. <laughs> let's talk, lay down right here and let's talk, Okay. I need to get inside your head. I need to find out so I can minister to somebody else. I want to know. If the woman, if, when I meet the woman at the well, it's going to be a long day. I'm going to say, baby, tell, tell me why you had five husbands, okay? Can you tell me that story, you know? Jesus didn't question any of that. I, I want to know. I want to know. I want to know. I, lo I love the, the brain and emotions and, and people's stories. But the unclean spirit. And, and he, he's, but here's the thing. Let's look at... Um, Verse 29, I, I definitely need to show you this. Well, that wasn't where I needed to be. Y'all got to look at this word. Luke 8, 29. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. And he broke the bonds and was... What's this word? Whew. That's the key. That's the key. You will know that your mind is under attack when you feel driven. Because the Bible is very specific about God's way of leading. He leads. Enemy drives. Sheep follow. Cattle have to be driven. You got to understand this word it just really paints the biggest part of this story for me because he says because the 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 um, he said in bonds and was driven by 
the demons into the wilderness. Driven, not led. See, whenever you feel like something's driving you to do something, that's when you need to stop. This is not a storm. This is a this is a an This is a, a, an, an attack. This is when spiritual warfare has to become a real thing to you. This is when you better pull out your your sharpest sword and your thickest shield. This is when you you got to say, I'm running into this battle. I don't have anything on my back, so I have no retreat in me. When I run into this, I'm I'm not going in to have to run back. I'm going in to take the head of my giant. I will not be driven there are businesses and, tr- and people out there who try to drive you to do things. The enemy c- gets behind and tries and, and drives you to, to, to get uh, revenge on somebody or take, take your own chances and, and, and do things outside of God's will. He gets behind you and push. And when you feel driven, when you feel driven to do anything, you've got to realize right now that is not God. God does not drive me to still waters. He leads me. He leads me. He does not drive me. The Egyptians drove the Hebrews with whips to, to make uh, brick and, 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 uh, for, for, for their pyramids and everything. you got to understand that only a taskmaster... Pushing slaves would want to to drive you. And that's why we feel so bound sometimes to the enemy when, when, he, when, he, when we get, get to a certain place in life. When, when we refuse to speak to the last storm. That, look, you didn't speak to the last storm. You didn't know that another one was on the horizon. And because you were so you you because we did not speak to the last storm and use our faith in the last storm, we're not properly prepared for the one that's coming next. Do you know we we have to face the storm and we have to speak to the storm because that gives us strength for the next storm. Has anybody felt driven lately? Is is a lot of us just feel like I. I I had this young lady when uh, when I was a youth pastor here. I had this this girl uh, who would um, sing for us, and she every other weekend she was going. She was at, of that age where always in a wedding, always in a wedding. You know, her friends are having babies, and they're all getting married. And she's always and she was just was so driven just to get married. And I was like, you know what? It feels like it feels like something's pushing you to do that. It, it's you may feel like you're missing out so something socially. But you know what, God, wait for God to bring you the right person. If you feel driven to go marry somebody, that's going to end bad. But when you're led to a person, when God leads you to the right person, amen? Look how blessed my wife is. June the 11th, 30 years. Your reward in heaven is huge, (laughs) huge. But I love this. It says, when when the people of the town knew who that was, they found him sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's huge. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. I want to say something here. I don't want it to be condemning. When we're not at the feet of Jesus, his situation is often what we find ourselves in. Hallelujah. (laughs) Gesundheit. (laughs) When we are not at the feet of Jesus, look, this man's first response was close and at the feet of Jesus. I want us to live at the feet of Jesus. Because when we're at the feet of Jesus, we're less likely to find ourselves in the situation that man just came out of. See, a lot of times we don't start at the feet of Jesus, but we end there. Here's what the term right mind. 
Here's what it means. You look it up. It means sound mind. I love this. Verse 36 says, when they came and found him, they found him sitting at the feet of Jesus in his right mind. And I, I think it's verse 36 says he's healed. Healed. Do you know that word healed is the, the same word we use for our salvation? Sozo. He is saved, delivered, and made whole. But I love that they use the term in his right mind. Can you imagine when, when he probably started out in town and people would just go, man, that kid is out of his mind. Whew. Sound Right mind means a soundness of mind. It means in a good condition. They found him in a good condition. Not damaged, not injured, not diseased. He had 5,000 demons inside of him that could have could really messed him up, but he was in his right mind, not, of sound mind and good condition, not damaged, injured, or diseased. He, this is what the right mind, right mind means this, financially secure. It means acting in moderation. In other words, not irrational and not fearful. L let me stop right here. You don't have to have 5,000 demons to not be in your right mind. When you, when we are irrational and fearful, this is probably where that guy started. Irrational, fearful. What door did that open up for him? We're not going to open those doors. We're closing those doors. Amen? I, re I rebuke fear from this church in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? It means he was disciplined and self-controlled. Say self-controlled. Self Let me give you some scriptures on the mind, okay? Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing. renewing. In other words, it was new at one time. Renew it. The renewing of your mind. It's a continual, continual, continual. This new mind, you've been in the Word all week. That's great. You gotta, you've got been renewing your mind. Next week, guess what? you got to keep renewing your mind. It is a continual lifetime uh, job to continually renew your mind. It's not a one-time thing. Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. A lot of people do not ever get to this stage where they understand the will of God for their life because they refuse to renew their minds. God, what do you want me to do? God is such a mystery. God, I'm so confused. God, there's a big fork in the road. You learn the will of God by renewing your mind. Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The Word of God is spiritual food for your mind. The Word of God. Amen. Hebrews 4 12 says this, For the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word will reveal, not, will reveal your true intentions. To you, and when you sharpen that, you'll be able to use it. He says it's a discerner. You'll be you'll learn to discern even the thoughts and intents of somebody else. Somebody's trying to take advantage of you. Everything looks good on the outside. All the eyes are dotted, the T's are crossed, but but the Holy Spirit will tell you something ain't right. Hebrew verse four, verse thirteen, right after it says, "And there is no creature hidden from His sight, <laughs> but all things are naked and open to the eye of Him to whom." We must give account. Isaiah 26, 3 says this. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Look, I, I love Hebrews, I mean, uh, Mark eleven twenty two. 22. says, have faith in God. Four, four, four words right there that you could preach on forever because we have a lot of things we trust in before we get to trusting in God. Well, let me see what's in my account. Let me see what daddy's got. See how much room's on the credit card. None of that works. God, I need your help. So 
start with, God, I need your help. <laughs> oh, it's, it's time. Y'all, it's time. Where's Brother Keith? Come on. Proverbs 4, 23 says this. Keep your heart. Keep your heart. Keep your heart. Keep whose heart? Your heart is your responsibility. Somebody broke my heart. Well, you put it in their hands. I'm, I'm sorry. I know that sounds harsh. It sounds harsh. But he didn't, says, I'll keep, he didn't say, I'll keep your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Now here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with two, two scriptures. Because we talked about right mind being soundness of mind. Listen to what he says. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a what? Sound mind. Sound mind. Now, I want to just finish painting my picture. Let me put the last few strokes on this picture we painted about this demoniac man. Okay? The spirit that God gives us when we get born again is a spirit of power. He's a teaching spirit, a loving spirit. He's a correcting spirit. Amen? The Holy Spirit, but this is, there's no other spirit that has this word attached to it. Holy. That's why I love the Bible. It, it, there's, I've, got, I've got hundreds of books, but only my Bible says holy. So the spirit that is living inside of me is set apart by God. It is holy. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Here's, here, here's what it says in the, in the Passion. And this is our last little brush strokes. For God will not give you the spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. Sound mind is translated self-control. Where did this man's demonic problems start? No self-control. His door, the doors opened when he had no control of self. Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and... As, a, as this, this demoniac, if he were to tell us his story... It probably starts start somewhere saying, I had no control. I was out of control. I had no self-discipline. I had no one, no one to discipline me, no one to correct me, no one to rein me in. Let's all stand up. God is so good. So good. If you feel like you are in a place where you have a lack of self-control. Now, I'm going to tell you, can, can I just be honest? I want you to see I am having to learn more and more self-control in my own life. I have felt for years that I have done very well in a lot of areas. I've not fallen for the tricks, some of the tricks that the enemy has laid out for me. I've had opportunities as a minister to do some very, very wicked things. And praise God that I have not fallen for any of them. I can stand up here right now and tell you that me and Amy, Pastor Brian, Pastor Rhonda, Pastor Stephen, Pastor Tina. I don't know about Pastor Stephen. I'm just kidding. We have been a scandal-free ministry for 30 years. In the places, the little places I feel like I don't have as much control. Can I just tell you that sometimes when I'm frustrated, I will eat. And I'm praying diligently and daily. I'm working my body, changing my mind, working my body, filling my mind with the word, telling myself that I got to speak to storms, not try to eat through them. M&M's do not solve problems. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> What's that? 
<laughs> I told Healing School yesterday, I said, uh, because Amy, Amy had been talking in prayer before and talking about different things, and, and uh, we talked a lot about self-control and, and uh, gluttony. Yeah, gluttony. And uh, I got up and I told him, I said, uh, strawberry frosting is no substitute for strawberries. <laughs> but the enemy has been playing tricks on your mind. And instead of knowing what to do with the confusion in your mind, and the, and the, because, because here's what worry does worry paints a picture of something that has not happened yet. That's why worry is so dangerous. That's why fear has torment. Because your mind tells you the worst case scenario and you haven't even seen evidence of that yet. We're breaking right now those controlling powers. Pastor, I, I want to I get you to come up here and pray. Can I get you to come up here and pray? You can use this microphone. I want... I just feel like there was something, I just feel like there was some authority in you that you can pray over this group who want to receive freedom. I believe there was some authority that, that you would be able to speak. There's an anointing for breakthrough right now. And if you don't want to be facing if you don't want to come and say, well, I think I got some demons now, I, I, I want you to understand, you don't have to, de demons have no power over you. They're weak and helpless. They only have the power you give them. But for those of you who have allowed emotional traumas and distresses to be a part of your life, if you, if you don't face your issues with faith, you face them with food or you with anger and lashing out, as he prays, I want you to receive your deliverance in Jesus' name. Father, we give you praise. Your word says that your house is a house of prayer. And your house is a house of praise. And Father, there's a number of people, all of us that assemble ourselves in this place. We come here and we are thankful for the the privilege of prayer and the power of praise. But, Father, I pray tonight for that one, that two, that 12, that's 26. I pray for that one tonight, Lord, that has been coming to this place and needs deliverance. Your, your word says that perfect love cast out fear and that fear has torment. And, sir, we thank you that you... Romans 12, 3, you've given us a measure of faith. But tonight, our faith has been increased because of Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And Father, we, we have found ourselves in this place of praise, in this place of prayer. Your word says, have we not read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? Thou hast perfected praise. Psalm said that thou hast ordained strength because of our enemy. And Father, we believe tonight that the, the prayer that has taken place in this room tonight before the service has started, the praise that has taken place during the time of worship, and the power of the word that has come forth tonight, is breaking chains and bringing deliverance all of us thank you Lord more than the 26 all of us and Father I receive that tonight let's say that together Father I receive that tonight I receive that tonight now with a soft voice I receive that tonight in Jesus name Thank you, sir. Thank you. I want to address nicotine. As he was praying, I just heard some people have been, nicotine just makes you feel 
uh, like you're, it, 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 you feel like it calms you, but you know the damage it's doing to you. Father, I just rebuke the spirit. I don't know if nicotine's a spirit, but I rebuke the spirit that drives you to nicotine. I rebuke the spirit of addiction right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you right now. I rebuke the spirit of alcohol, alcoholism, God. They call alcohol spirits for a reason. God, I thank you right now that, Lord, we just renounce the work of alcohol in our lives. We renounce the work of pornography in our life. We break every chain right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you right now. Deliverance is coming to every captive in this room. Everybody watching online, everybody who will watch on their line, that same anointing will be here. Father, we thank you right now that, Father, because, because these things are being broken, your physical body is being restored. There's healing in you, coming in your body right now. Breathing better than you ever have. Lord, I thank you right now that there's a, a healer doing a work in this house. Somebody in here, when you got divorced, you ran to alcohol. And, and, it, and it caused you to go even further into a darker place. And God it has called you out and you've walked out, but you've, you've stood on the outside. You've stood on the edge of, of condemnation, just thinking that's where you need to live. Close to church, close to relationship with God, but just feeling bad. And I'll break that over you right now in Jesus' name. Come out. Come out from that condemnation. Come out from that condemnation right now in the name of Jesus. Come out from that condemnation and walk in the light as he is in the light. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For all the people who've been divorced and, and have scars from their, their divorce or divorces, God, I thank you right now. You're healing the scars. You're healing the minds. You're healing the heartache that came through divorce. God, we just thank you right now that, Lord, there, there, there's, there's somebody in here. You, you were talked about on the job so much that it, it kind of climbed a corporate ladder. And, and though you didn't get fired for it, you can tell it has hindered. The lies have hindered your promotion. Your work is excellent, but God is restoring you. You do not have to leave where you are. God is restoring you. Somebody is going to figure out that, that, that what, what they see in you is not what they heard about you. And they're going to, they're going to, they're, you're going to go from promotion to promotion to promotion. It's going to be a suddenly, but it's going to be a, a life-changing moment for you. Because with those changes, God has said he's also restoring the raises that should have come with it. Somebody's going to look at you and say, if we don't promote this person because of their excellence, we're going to lose them and we're going to lose our blessing. That's how valuable you are. I bind fear of moving on. I bind the fear of moving on. Some of you are, are laying right at your leg, just made a home at your last failure. God says, you are moving on right now. There, you, your failure is being erased, so you don't even know where you fell. <laughs> you don't even know where to lay out down anymore. You don't know where to quit anymore. You've used your failure as a landmark for your life. But God is healing you right now from emotional stress and trauma. In Jesus' name. Can everybody lift their hands up, please? Father, I speak over every man and woman in this, war, in this room. I declare, Father, that the head and not the tail above only and not beneath. They're blessed in the city, the field, and the store. They're blessed with their going out and they're coming in, Father. And I thank you right now. They'll never come behind in any good thing. And, Father, we rebuke, Father, the enemy from their life and their stuff. Lord, I call them blessed exceedingly and abundantly, Father. And the blessing of the Lord is making them rich and add no sorrow to it. If you believe that, you receive it. Say amen. 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 Come on, y'all give God a hand. Thank you, Lord.